Florida was sculpted by the sea. In recent geologic time, several dramatic rises in sea level occurred. During one of them, the entire Florida Peninsula almost disappeared beneath the waves. Almost. As it approached its highest point between two and three million years ago, the sea pushed up enormous sand dunes, forming a chain of islands that must have looked much like the Bahamas do today. That was all that was left of the Florida Peninsula. And that's where I'm standing right now, on top of an island sand dune millions of years old. Of course, the sea has receded, frozen into polar ice. Today, this is central Florida, 200 feet above sea level, 60 miles from the sea. Down there is where the ocean was. Drained of salt water by nature and fresh water by man, it would become a land of ranching and farming. But here on the much older high ground, where the seas never washed over the land, plants and animals continued to survive and evolve. Oh, it was never a Garden of Eden. Conditions were harsh. The odds against survival were great. There are no nutrients in this pure sand. The land is baked with sun and heat, drenched by tropical rain in the summer, swept by frequent fire. For most of the year, there's little or no water. During the brief summer rainy season, there are sudden, violent thunderstorms, but the water disappears quickly through the porous sand. The plants and animals that have survived and prospered on this tiny ridge of sandy islands are among nature's most remarkable success stories. I'm Bill Curtis, and this is the Florida Scrub. If it were not for pioneer aviator and explorer Richard Archbold, the attention of scientists might never have been drawn to the Florida scrub. But in 1941, Archbold founded an independent biological research facility in the center of the state, near the town of Lake Placid. Scientists invited to do research at the Archbold Biological Station found themselves in a wilderness of miniature oaks, palmettos, and cactus. As they looked more closely, they began to discover plants and animals never before described by science. Yet even as they began to know and appreciate this remarkable habitat, it tragically began to disappear. Today, Archbold's 5,000 acres are a globally significant nature preserve. And scientists like Dr. James Lane have dedicated their careers to unraveling its mysteries. Well, this is the uh, Florida mouse, which is uh, probably the most uh, interesting a uh, mammal in Florida. Uh, externally, it looks very much like a member of the uh, white-footed mouse genus, and in fact, for many years, was considered uh, to be related. But we now know from internal uh, morphology uh, that it's a very distinctive uh, form, and it is not related to any of the uh, mammals of eastern United States. We find its closest relatives in southern Mexico and Guatemala. And in fact, it has an interesting flea uh, that is almost exclusive to it, and that flea has its closest relatives in northern uh, South America. So this is one of those species of uh, Western affinity or Central American affinity that got into Florida uh, millions of years ago and uh, evolved here. Discoveries such as these led scientists to realize that a great dry ecosystem of savanna and scrublands once stretched north from Central America to the American West and across the Gulf Coast to Florida itself. But rising seas and climatic change isolated central Florida from that ecosystem. Here, a ridge of ancient sand dunes survived as a chain of islands. The plants and animals that endured these catastrophic changes, once part of a great continental ecosystem, were now completely cut off from their kind. The sea receded and the land returned. The islands that had survived the inundation now formed a distinct spine down the center of the state. Today, the sandy spine is called the Lake Wales Ridge. From the air, one can see clearly the old shoreline. The land on the right is comparatively new, wet, and rich in organic sediments. The land on the left is Lake Wales Ridge scrub, ancient, dry, and lacking in soil nutrients. Though no longer surrounded by water, ecologically, the ridge is still a series of islands. 
in many ways as distinct as the Galapagos Islands in the Pacific. And like the Galapagos, there are plants and animals that have survived and continued to evolve here, that belong only here, and live nowhere else. Rain in Florida is usually abundant during the summer months, and scrub on the Lake Wales Ridge receives its share. But most of the water simply drains through the porous white sand to aquifers deep beneath these ancient dunes. In a state famous for its scenic riverways, lush forests, and vast wetlands, scrub is paradoxically a desert-like environment. As if to compound the hardship, Central Florida experiences more lightning strikes than any other region of North America. Dead leaves and other plant material build enough fuel to carry a wildfire every few years, and the dry oaks and palmettos that dominate the scrub appear defenseless against this intense wall of heat and flame. But these plants do not die. Most of their mass lives underground as immense root systems. Scientists have shown that many plants and animals which have evolved in the scrub not only tolerate fire, but depend on it for regeneration or reproduction. Within a few weeks after a fire, the scrub is alive with new greenery. And within a few years, the oaks and other woody shrubs have reached their mature height of three to four feet, only to burn again. The gopher tortoise has survived by staying cool in its deep burrow, a shelter it shares with the Florida mouse and a number of other scrub animals. This ancient relic from the desert southwest survives not only the several fires that occur over a lifespan as long as our own, but as a species, it has survived millions of years of heat, fire, drought, and climatic change. We're standing uh, on the top of one of the last really good, beautiful rosemary balds left in the scrubs of this uh, ridge. Biologist John Fitzpatrick has been studying the Florida scrub for over 20 years. In that time, most of it has disappeared before his eyes, and he's become a determined advocate for this most endangered ecosystem. Dr. Fitzpatrick is now the executive director of the Archbold Biological Station. But it's easy to look at a scrub like this and see nothing. <laughs> it, it doesn't look like it's endangered. It doesn't look like it's uh, useful for anything. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's right. <laughs> no, that's true. A scrub doesn't have an instantly uh, captivating physical impression. The reason is we tend to look at things that are big and hanging and lush as the captivating images. Sure. What you have to do to realize the beauty of scrub is to get down and focus your eyes at the size scale of an ant or a gopher tortoise ponderously wandering through this huge forest of oak trees that it's looking up to. When you think at that scale, now you're looking at all these myriad little lichens and mushrooms yes. and uh, flowering St. John's warts and scrub mm -hmm. plums and suddenly the whole place is alive and it takes a new dimension. Yes, it does. Uh, when you get your eyes down to the uh -huh. elfin scale that this system is, has evolved to. Oh, Bill, here's a, one of the more attractive of the endangered species set. This what is, is this? The, uh, the scrub blazing star and the group Liatris. This is one of the common groups that is used in ornamental flower bouquets around the world. This it looks like a blazing star, a little bit of color in the middle right, of all this. Right, it is a, it's a beauty. You can see the seed heads right here. This mm -hmm. is one of these plants that's an entire world distribution is from right about here, this is one of the southernmost plants, mm. to about 30 miles north of here, just on this little strip of sand, only in the tops of these high islands. As we continued to walk through this unassuming place, Dr. Fitzpatrick pointed out dozens of plants and animals that could be found nowhere else on Earth. In fact, we were surrounded by one of the highest concentrations of rare and endangered species in the continental United States. 
one of the thoughts about protecting endangered habitats like this that are so full of species that occur nowhere else is that they're a whole gold mine of genetic information. These are plants that have spent a million years evolving ways to deal with a very specialized kind of problem. Hot, wet summers, cool, dry winters, no nutrients in the soil, all these things that humans have to deal with in our agricultural systems all over the world. These plants may be holding secrets to how we can end up genetically uh, engineering our own agricultural systems to improve through time, especially dealing with a warmer planet. The problem is, there's so little of this land left that it's literally possible we may lose the system entirely. The critically endangered Lake Placid scrub mint is pollinated chiefly by this bee fly, yet its strong peppermint smell is a powerful insect repellent. Scientists have now isolated the insect repelling chemical in the laboratory. This rare and endangered plant with a world distribution less than 10 miles long might prove to have a world-class role for humans. And who knows what this rare scrub specialist might have to tell us. It has no close relatives anywhere in the world. It is seldom seen spending almost its entire life swimming under the surface of the sand where temperatures are cooler. Its legs, no longer needed, have virtually disappeared. The sand skink is on the U.S. endangered species list. We know almost nothing about it, yet its ancient history may be nearly over. But if the sand skink has trouble getting noticed, the same can't be said for this little charmer, the Florida scrub jay. This wonderful little bird looks much like the scrub jay of the American West, but it's evolved some remarkable adaptations from its long isolation in the Florida scrub. That so much is known about the Florida scrub jay is the result of over 22 years of intensive research at Archbold by Dr. Glenn Wolfenden, along with Dr. Fitzpatrick. The scrub jay has been an ideal subject. Besides being easy to observe in the low oak scrub, they are extremely intelligent and quickly learn to trust the scientists who study them. There's a nice dominance behavior. That's a father over his daughter. Over his two-year-old daughter. He's 13 this year? Yeah. And didn't we just figure out he has bred for his 12th straight breeding season, which we've never had before? Record. Right. right. And he knows there's another peanut in here. And we're standing <laughs> within a few meters of where the uh, all-time record holder, That's who is right. dead, who is his father, who is his father, <laughs> lived. And he uh, died at 14 and a half. Right. If I remember yeah. right. Yeah. Florida jays, as 18th century explorer William Bartram called them, live on insects during most of the year. But during the winter months, food is scarce, and they rely almost exclusively on acorns. These they carefully harvest and bury by the thousands every fall, one by one. Jay families establish permanent territories, which they defend vigorously at all times of the year. Each breeding pair requires about 20 acres of oak scrub to provide for its needs, and here they will spend their entire lives. Offspring in this rare and patchy habitat face a problem. All available scrub territory is filled to capacity with other jay families, and they will defend their ground against trespass. So a young jay has no choice but to stay at home until a breeding territory becomes available. This might not happen for years. In the meantime, it helps out at home. It will join its parents in defending the territory, guarding against predators. And even bringing food to its younger brothers and sisters. The family unit that results is strong. Breeding pairs with helpers produce more offspring than those without helpers. This remarkable adaptation is known as cooperative breeding, and ultimately it provides an avenue by which young jays acquire territories in the fiercely competitive Florida scrub. Good helpers cause the family and territory to grow in size at the expense of neighboring breeders whose family size is decreasing. This allows a helper to eventually inherit the back 40 and establish a new territory without ever leaving home. The number of scrub jays is only a fraction of what it was when Wolfenden and Fitzpatrick began their research a little over 20 years ago. 
Today it's listed by the federal government as a threatened species, but its numbers are still declining. There's no mystery about what happened to them. The Florida scrub jay is a specialist, uniquely adapted by evolution to the peculiar habitat of the Florida oak scrub. It cannot survive anywhere else. But what little habitat is left is disappearing fast. The well-drained sands and numerous sinkhole lakes make the ridge attractive to developers and even more attractive to the citrus industry. Much of what remains of the scrub jay's home is unprotected. And with the rate of scrub loss continuing at a rapid pace, this is Florida's most endangered habitat. Today, a flight over the Lake Wales Ridge reveals a great sea of citrus. Recent killing freezes further north in Florida have led citrus growers to expand quickly to the south. Only about 10% of the original Lake Wales Ridge scrub habitat remains. The small pieces that have survived are mostly in private hands and unprotected. Almost all of it is slated for conversion to citrus or housing developments. This 1,600-acre moonscape was, until recently, one of the best examples of undisturbed scrub on the Lake Wales Ridge. But when the bulldozers descended on it, millions of years of continuous natural history were destroyed in just a few days. A visitor to the site after the destruction noted that the resident scrub jay families were perched on the piles of rubble. Having no open territories to go to and no acorn stores left in the ground, they had to leave. Most probably they fell to predators or died of starvation. The rest of the animals, the gopher tortoises, Florida mice, sand skinks, and others that couldn't get out of the way of the giant blades were already dead. The Lake Wales Ridge once supported almost half a million acres of scrub. Today, all but about 30,000 acres have been lost forever. It's clear that before the year 2000, Florida scrub will be gone, except where land has been acquired specifically for habitat protection. About 40 remaining patches of scrub have been identified as critical to the preservation of this endangered ecosystem. Most are privately owned, but if purchased and preserved as a group, they would form a network of scrub islands close enough to each other that pollen could pass between plant populations, and scrub jays could move from one island to the next. Well, what is going to happen to this? Well, this particular scrub is potentially a very exciting spot and story. We are working on a system of preserves. Uh, we're hoping to get a whole system protected, and this is actually a piece of the largest remaining intact scrub that's out of protection right now. Mm -hmm. And so actually there is some good chance that the ground we're staying on uh, will soon be purchased through a combination of state and even federal dollars uh, and turned into the first wildlife refuge specifically for endangered plants. Wow. This is a system where we actually have a hope of being able to raise a flag someday, have a party and say, this is a saved ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And the American conservation movement really needs that kind of thing. This is a chance right here in our own country to preserve something as rare and marvelous as an alpine valley in the Himalayas or a cloud forest in Peru. The Florida scrub is an island in time. Its time could be almost up, or with a little help from us now, could evolve for another million years. I'm Bill Curtis.